Imagine this, a mom, Maya, walks into clinic with her six-year-old Liam. He's funny, bright, and lately exhausted. Three anti-seizure medicines in. His seizures are a little better, but his spark is dimmer. The pediatric neurologist, let's call her Dr. Patel, cares deeply. She tweaks dosages, swaps one drug for another, and schedules a follow-up. But if I were there in that moment, I'd ask a question more doctors should feel comfortable asking. Has anyone talked with you about nutrition, specifically a ketogenic diet as a treatment option? Not weight loss keto, medical keto. The one that started it all in 1921. Here's the short version of that history. In the early 1900s, physicians noticed something curious. When patients fasted, seizures often improved. Dr. Hugh Coughlin used fasting clinically. Dr. R.H. Guilin reported it in 1921. Around the same time, biochemist Roland Widget showed that fasting and very low carb, high fat eating produce ketone bodies. That's when a Mayo Clinic physician named Russell M. Wilder connected the dots. If fasting helps because it raises ketones, could a diet that mimics fasting by producing ketones deliver the same seizure control without starving kids? He coined the phrase ketogenic diet in July 27, 1921, and proposed a very high fat, very low carb regimen to treat epilepsy. Wilder's initial write-ups were brief, but it was catalytic. Produce ketonemia on purpose, and you might calm the brain's electrical storms. Within a few years, Mayo Clinic pediatrician Mini Gustav Peterman turned Wilder's idea into a precise clinical protocol, the classic ketogenic diet, typically a four to one ratio of fat to combined protein and carbohydrate. He reported that many children had major seizure reductions on this regimen. In other words, the concept matured from hypothesis to a reproducible bedside therapy. Why would it work? From a root cause lens, the diet shifts brain fuel from glucose to ketones, changes neurotransmitter balance, stabilizes neuronal membranes, and may cool neuroinflammation. It also improves metabolic flexibility, teaching the brain to run smoothly on an alternate fuel when glucose-driven excitability becomes a problem. Wilder didn't have our modern mechanisms, but clinically he was right. Ketones often settle the storm. Now, some of you are thinking, nice history lesson, doc, but does it still work in today's medicine? Yes, and we have good data. In a landmark prospective study at John Hopkins, 150 children with drug-resistant epilepsy started ketogenic therapy. At one year, over half remained on the diet and about a quarter enjoyed greater than 90% seizure reduction. That 1998 paper kick-started the modern revival. Randomized trials followed. In 2008, a UK study in Lancet Neurology randomized children to immediate ketogenic therapy versus usual care for three months. The diet group had significantly greater seizure reduction, validating what Wilder and Peterson intuitively knew nearly a century earlier. This isn't folklore, it's evidence-based therapy. What about today's protocols? We no longer require prolonged fasting or harsh fluid restriction. Those were part of early playbooks. Many centers start the diet more gently, but the principle remains. High fat, very low carb, adequate protein, medically supervised. Classic therapy often provides roughly 70 to 90% of calories from fat with individualized ratios like four to one or three to one. Variations such as the modified Atkins diet can be effective for some families who need a less rigid approach. Back to Maya, Liam, and Dr. Patel. Medicines matter. Surgery can be life-saving. Vagal nerve stimulators help some, but it's a disservice, borderline historical amnesia, to forget that nutrition was once frontline therapy for pediatric epilepsy and remains a powerful adjunct today. Real-world practice aims for synergy. If diet reduces seizure burden, you can sometimes simplify medications and reduce sedating side effects, giving kids a shot at thriving, not just surviving. Modern reviews consistently underscore ketogenic therapy as a legitimate option for refractory epilepsy when managed by a trained team. As an obesity and metabolic health doc, here's why this story matters beyond seizures. One, 
is a masterclass in root cause thinking. Change the metabolic context and the brain's behavior changes. Two, it checks our bias. We're dazzled by new drugs and many are worthy of celebration, but new isn't automatically better. Sometimes yesterday's wisdom just needs today's rigor. Three, it reminds clinicians that an NPO order or a keto prescription is not just a diet. It's a targeted physiological therapy with a clear mechanism and outcome metrics. Now let's talk practicality. Ketogenic therapy for epilepsy is not the influencer version of keto. It's medical nutrition therapy with labs, growth monitoring, and a registered dietitian who lives and breathes grams and ratios. Families get trained to weigh foods, track ketones, and watch for side effects like constipation, kidney stones, or micronutrient gaps. These risks are manageable with a competent team and worth it when seizures drop and cognition, mood, and energy rebound. That's not romanticizing. That's what the data and many parents report. If you're a clinician, here's your nudge. Before escalating to a third or fourth medication, ask yourself, have we offered a dietary therapy consult? If you're a parent, advocate respectfully. Ask your neurologist, do you offer classic ketogenic diet or modified Atkins through your center? Can we meet the keto team? If your system doesn't have one, many regional or academic centers do, and they often share protocols. The worst that can happen is you learn more. The best? You give your child a shot at fewer seizures, fewer meds, and more life in their days. And for my colleagues who worry that using keto in kids means endorsing random internet diets, nope. This is the opposite of casual. It's structured, supervised, and goal-directed. We should be as comfortable prescribing a medically sound nutrition intervention as we are writing for a second anticonvulsant. Wilder's point still resonates. If ketones are the therapeutic signal, why not produce them predictably? Let's close with Liam. Six months after starting a medically supervised ketogenic plan, his seizures are down dramatically. His teacher says he's engaged again. Dr. Patel smiles at the follow-up because, this time, she wasn't anticipating which medicine she had to increase or add. She was looking for opportunities to deprescribe. That's the legacy of 1921 living in 2025, an old new therapy that reminds us medicine is bigger than the pill bottle. If we know where we've come from, we'll make wiser choices about where we're going. Wilder 1921 wasn't about a fad, it was about giving children back their future. A century later, that's still a mission worth honoring and using. I'll see you in the next video.